onto my YouTube channel. Before I head on with this video, make sure you hit that subscribe button. So today, guys, we're going to be going through the Seamless Study Guide by Angie Smith, where she takes us through the whole Bible as understanding it as God's one seamless love story. So today, guys, we're officially on week three. And as I've said in previous videos, make sure to go and watch the other videos first because this is a series that we are going through. By the way, guys, I hope you love my hair. I've literally just had it done today. My friend's done it. She's got her own business. She's absolutely amazing. She always does my hair. I will list her details down below, but take a look. It is amazing. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, but yeah, so let's get into week three. Okay, so as I said at the end of week one, if you watch those videos, um, Angie Smith actually goes through a um, review week, um, like a homework kind of thing, um, where she asks you a list of questions and she refers to each day and asks like a question. For example, day one, she asks, what all did God call Abraham to do and what did God promise Abraham I said Abraham, I'm sure I said Abraham. Abraham, sorry, because it was Abraham before it was Abraham. Um, and what did God promise Abraham that he, God, would do in response? She, she, so then she said, what's distinctive about a covenant anyway and why is it so important? So she wants you to just reflect on those days. So I'd say go and take a minute to reflect on some of these things um, that you know, we've gone through in previous videos. Um, even if it's just at the end of each video, you just kind of reflect on what we've gone through and what we've read through. I don't want to go through all of all these all of these questions now because this is gonna make the video so long. Um I probably should have started doing just a video where we're just reviewing it. That would have been a good idea, but it's whether you guys would be interested in that, whether you guys would like it. If you do want me to do things like that then comment down below and let me know, guys. So let's get into week three, day one, because we've got a whole book to get through. But don't take that as me saying this is gonna be long because it's not. Honestly, I learned the whole Bible through this one book. And look, it's not even a big book. <laughs> So, day, week three, day one, we're going to be learning about Exodus. So, there is a book in the Bible, if you guys don't already, already know, called Exodus, which is after Genesis. So, week three. Can you believe it? There's no time to waste. So, let's just jump right into the second book of the Bible, Exodus. If you recall the end of last week's lesson, we had just said goodbye to old Joseph, whose body was buried in Egypt. Then she goes on to say, the people of Israel went to Egypt during the famine Joseph predicted, and now, many years later, they have become a threat to the Egyptians. The Israelites have grown in number, and the Pharaoh fears that they might gain too much power. He tells his people to treat them as slaves, Ordering them, ordering that they may be mercifully treated in an attempt to subdue them. But it doesn't work. So Pharaoh comes up with a backup plan. He tells the midwives they are to kill any baby boys born to the Israelites. The Hebrew, girl, Hebrew girls are left alone. By the way, guys, I missed this little bit on the side. She basically, on some day, she adds like, I'm not sure if you can see it, but meow. If it's gonna let you see, no, it's not. Basically, she adds like little um comments down the side, um, and they just help you with the stories along. So, what she said on this one, she said, like a beautiful tapestry, tapestry. I think I've said that correctly. The Bible uses patterns of repeated events to signal really big moments in history. We see one with Moses. So, we see one with Moses, special circumstances around a child who will lead God's people. Isaac born to Sarah when she was far past menopause. Moses miraculously saved from death as a baby. Samuel's special birth, ushering in the period of kings and prophets. And Isaiah predicting the virgin birth of one called God with us. John the Baptist, specially um, predicted and born to a barren mother. And then Jesus, the ultimate miraculous birth to save God's people. So let's get back into day one. So then she asks a question. How did the midwives respond to this, to this decree? So 
she's basically asking in response to um, Pharaoh ordering all the babies to be killed. Um, how did the midwives respond to this? And we can find this in chapter, in Exodus, chapter 1, verse 17. I hope you guys have got your Bibles with you. Okay, chapter 1, verse 17. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Okay, so then Angie says, the birth of Moses. In chapter 2 of Exodus, we meet one of the heroes of the Bible. Read verse 1 to 10 and answer the following. From which tribe did Moses' mother and father come from? Okay, verse 1, chapter 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a pap wrist basket i hope i've said that correctly for him and coated it with tar and pitch then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the nile his sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him then pharaoh's daughter went down to the nile to bathe and her tenders were walking along the river bank she saw the baskets among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it she opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Verse 7. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went on and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of water. Okay, so to answer Angie's question, from which tribe did Moses' mother and father come? That would have been Levi tribe. So, let's move on. Maybe in the past, you've had, had no context of what that meant. But now remember that Levi was one of Jacob's 12 sons. And the Levites were the priesthood of the nation of Israel. So instead of just glossing over this and storying your another part of a verse that doesn't really make sense to me, category, I'm taking this opportunity to remind you that you already have a much better grip on the whole of scripture than you think you do. We'll see these words repeat over and over as we go, and now you have tools to make sense of what you're reading. As chapter 2 opens, a Hebrew woman, the genealogy reveals that her name was jo jo Bed. Think I said that correctly? <laughs> Any of those in your family, she asks. And then she says, the Hebrew woman had a baby boy. So, presumably, what do the midwives do when her son is born? Question. Next question. What does joke bed do for the next few months? Another question. Eventually, this gets tricky and she knows she has to let him go. If the Egyptians came across him, it'll be dangerous, not just for him, but for the whole family. What does she do at this point? And then her next question is, providentially, he is rescued. Who rescues him and what is the unexpected result of it? So basically, all of that is actually answered in chapter 2, verse 1 to 10. So what do the midwives do? The midwives let the babies live. So next question, what do the Jake what does Jake Bed do for the next few months? Which I believe this is when she hid him for three months. Then it's the question, eventually this gets tricky and she knows she has to let him go. If the Egyptians came across him, it'll be dangerous, not just for him but for their whole family. What does she do at that point? So she puts him in the basket, sends him across the river. Um and then Moses' sister, I believe, yep, yeah, watches him going over the water to make sure that he's okay. And then it says, who rescues him and what is the unexpected result of it? So the result is that um, that would have been Pharaoh's daughter who noticed the basket. Um, and then she sent her a slave to get it um and then they noticed the baby in it 
Um, and then they took it to the Hebrew woman to nurse. Okay, so moving on. So this is the second time we've seen this pattern of a Hebrew becoming part of the Egyptian Pharaoh's family. Hmm, are we getting onto something here? First with Joseph and now with Moses. Hmm. I could spend years studying the delicate twists and turns of Moses' life, but we don't have that luxury here. I'll do my best not to wander off too far from our path. But I want to point out something, and I think it is beautiful foreshadowing. When Moses was born, he was supposed to be thrown into the water. He wasn't. When he was a few months old, his mother put him in the water and he was rescued. If you're keeping score, that's Moses 2 and water 0. Trust me, it's a pattern that will come to a powerful crescendo to, in a bit. When he's when he ups the score a few more times. Moses grows up in Pharaoh's house and eventually sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew man. He becomes so enraged that he murders the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. Pharaoh hears about this and he's not too thrilled. He sets out to kill Moses, but Moses flees. I cannot make this point strongly enough. The Hebrew people, Abraham's descendants, are God's chosen people. They are the ones chosen by God to be in a covenant relationship. And for lack of better word, they're just special to him. All throughout the Bible, we're going to follow this thread. God wants the Israelites, also called Hebrews and later called Jews, to love and serve him. But God's people don't stay consistent in their affections. Over and over again, he woos them to himself. But the cycle continues. Keep that touch in your minds while we read this next bit, knowing that we're going to get in more into more detail in coming days. In light of that, read Exodus chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. Okay, verse 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God hearing their groans... God heard their groan, groaning, sorry, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. So, Angie says, I so hope you just read that, and couldn't help but notice it made more sense than it, than it might have a few weeks ago. I know it sure did for me. So, God calls Moses. God's paying close attention to his people, and he's not missing a thing. He's setting the scene here for a rescue, and the call to lead that rescue comes to Moses in a rather strange way. Read Exodus, Exodus chapter 3, verse 2, and record what happens. Okay, verse 2. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Angie says, have you wondered how the burning bush fits into everything? Well, now you know. It's a place where God spoke to Moses and told him what he was planning to do with him. Moses responded to God by saying, here I am, which is in Exodus 3 verse 4. He essentially said, I'm ready and I'm listening, Lord. God reminded Moses of an important fact. What did God say in Exodus chapter 3 verse 6? Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So Angie says, in the next few paragraphs, God tells Moses that he has better plans for his people than Egypt. He has a land set aside for them, and, he, and the land he has promised, and it's almost time to go there. He tells Moses that he's the guy to bring them of this horrible oppression and lead them to this amazing place and Moses struggles to believe he's capable. I'm sure we've all been there. God gives Moses a helpful yet not so exciting tidbit. You're going to ask Pharaoh to let the Israelites go and he's going to refuse you. Awesome, I'll just get right on that then. The plagues. Moses and his brother Aaron go to Pharaoh and just as God told them he would, Pharaoh refuses to release the Israelites. In response, God sends a series of 10 plagues to punish Pharaoh and Egyptians. And the Egyptians, sorry. And listen, they aren't ideal. 
I would not want to be an Egyptian in them times. Like, mm. these plagues include water turning to blood, frogs, gnats, or gnats, however you pronounce them, I don't know what they are, flies, the death of livestock, boils, hail, locusts, and darkness. These aren't coincidental, by the way. The Egyptians worshipped many nature gods. Each of the plagues were specific to those gods. For example, the Egyptians believed frogs were sacred and shouldn't be killed. They worshipped a frog-headed god that represented fertility. Uh, what the heck? To remind them that he was the only god, Yahweh allowed thousands of frogs to die in their homes, the stench rising up like their false worship. Oh. After nine plagues, Pharaoh still refused to let God's people leave their land, and Moses warned him of the final plague, the death of every firstborn child in Egypt. Wow, the Passover. If you know anything at all about the death of Christ, you'll understand why I have tears in my eyes, as I write in this next part. Just before the last plague happened, God commands his people to take a lamb without blemish, kill it at twilight, and put some of its blood on the doorposts of their homes. God explains that during the night, he will pass over every house marked with the blood, thereby protecting the firstborn children of his people. Tell me you see the beauty of this symbolism, because it isn't by accident. Jesus referred to it as the spotless lamb, will be sacrificed on our behalf and his blood protecting us from death. From early in scripture, we see the need for sacrifice in all sorts of situations. An item was sacrificed on behalf of the people, thereby making it a substitution. Jesus Christ will serve as the ultimate substitution. And all of these beautiful images are leading up to that moment. So we've traced the story from the beginning of time to a man named Moses, a man God will use to save his people and foreshadow his own coming. And all of it with this one simple goal, to rescue his beloved flock. If you are a believer in Christ, close this book today with the knowledge that you indeed have been passed over because of the inexplicable, abounding love of a saviour who paid the highest price on your behalf. If you have not yet become a follower of Jesus by placing your trust in him, I would encourage you in two ways. First, maybe you could find a believer you respect and talk to him or her about having a relationship with Christ. Secondly, please do not give up on this. Give up on this study. The more you put the pieces together, the better I hope you'll understand on what to respond to Jesus. The Bible is all about how Christ loves you personally. And wherever you are in your comprehension of that, I want you to feel welcome in these pages. Also know that if you fall into this category of I'm not really sure what to think of the Bible, of this Bible thing. Know that I'm praying specifically for you as I write these words. Thank you for the privilege of allowing me to, to be even a small part of your journey with him. So then Angie adds on the side the covenant name of God. Have you ever wondered about the names of Jehovah and Yahweh? They're both English e equivalents of the name of God in the Old Testament. God's name was represented by the four Hebrew consonants. Y H W H, and then she puts in brackets. Theologians, theologians. Wow, I need to read my dictionary again. Sorry, guys. Call it the Tetragrammaton. Centuries ago, English scholars thought it was a pronounce, pronounced Jehovah. Today, most agree Yahweh more closely represents the covenant names of God. Okay guys, so that is the end of week three, day one of this amazing story. How we just learned so much about God's love for us, about God's sacrifice for us, his sacrifice of his only beloved son, Jesus Christ, to die for us on the cross. Although we haven't reached that part of the Bible yet, as Angie has referred to it here, that it actually relates to all the sacrifices that did have to happen in the Old Testament and that Jesus ended up being the ultimate sacrifice, the replace of all of those other sacrifices. God is so merciful. He's so amazing. And doesn't this show us that the Bible is not just full of just facts, 
but it's actually full of a love story, God's love story to us, his relationship to us, his relationship that he wants to have with us. I just hope that everyone who's watching this is a believer of Jesus Christ. And if you're not, please feel free to message me. I will pray with you. I will talk with you. Answer any questions that I can to the best of my knowledge because I'm still learning a lot and on this journey as well, just as you guys are. But I will try and answer as much as I can. And if I feel that there's something that I can't answer, I will lead you to a place or to a person that may be able to help you. But guys, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Make sure to like, comment and subscribe. But yeah, bye guys. Mm -hmm.